Now, good evening, everyone. My name's Dodger Long, and I am a serving submariner, as are all of my team. We'll start by telling you all about who we are and what we've done. I've been in the Navy or in the submarine service for more than 33 years. Having gone as far um, as got, having gone to the North Pole and as far south as the Southern Ocean, as far east as Singapore and as far west as San Diego, where I spent five weeks carrying out missile firings. Now let's hear from the rest of my team. So first of all, Strax. Hi, good evening. My name is Strax. I joined the Royal Navy and was a volunteer for submarines in 2007. I have been to a few places, not quite as many as Dodger, but my highlight would be South Africa. Um, hopefully you enjoy tonight and any questions, please ask. Thanks very much for that, Strax. Uh, Rob? Yeah, evening everyone. My name is Rob. Um, I've been in the submarine service for 10 years now. Uh, I've only served on the Trafalgar class submarines as a marine engineer. Uh, uh, but to be fair, I haven't been to as many countries as George, as Dodge as probably a lot of us have. Um, one of my highlights so, is a nice five-star hotel, all expenses paid, and I am now currently serving as a specialist recruit for the submarine service. Thanks very much for that, Rob. Jamie. Good evening everyone, uh, my name is Jamie, I'm a leading writer submariner in the Navy and I have been for 21 years on uh, this Saturday coming actually as my naval birthday. Uh, I deal with all the administration for the, and uh, pay for the crew on board the boat. I've served on four different submarines as well as spending some time in um, Maud Main Building in London as well as serving an tour in Afghanistan. My last, job, my last job was working in a pay office in Portsmouth, and now I'm doing specialist recruiting for Central and East England. So I hope that you get on out tonight. Enjoy it. Thanks very much for that, Jamie. And finally, Smudge. I expect you've got your microphone muted. Hey, my name's Smudge. I've been in the Navy for seven and a half years, so not quite as long as the rest of them. I've always served on board Vanguard class submarines, so it's not quite as glamorous. You don't get to see as much of the world. However, I did spend six months in Florida, all expenses paid in a hotel, so that was lovely. And apart from that, I've just worked out with Fazlane. Thank you very much for that smudge. So moving on. Our introduction, the UK has three classes of submarines. These are the Astute class, the Trafalgar class, and the Vanguard class. This is what we will be talking about today. There are four submarines in the class, HMS Vanguard, Victorious, Vengeance, and Vigilant. At 16 and a half thousand tons and 150 meters long, and capable of remaining submerged for more than a hundred days, these are under more underwater communities for more for about 150 men and women. This is an image of one of the V boats at its home in fa um, at its home base in Faz Lane, which is on the west coast of Scotland. As you can see, a submarine sits low in the water and likens itself to an iceberg, with two thirds of its enormous bulk, bulk below the waterline. The Vanguard class submarine is an SSBN. This stands for Ships Submersible Ballistic Nuclear. These submarines are part of the UK's longest single military operation, Operation Relentless, which is more commonly referred to as CASD, the Continuous At Sea Deterrent, which means we have had a submarine at sea somewhere in the world's ocean remaining undetected for more than 50 years. Jamie. Cheers, Dodge. Yeah, well, what you're looking at here is known as the front row. This is made up of a four-man team which takes orders from the watch leader in the control room via the ship control officer of the watch. This team also includes one panel operator and two planesmen. The position highlighted that you can see is the planesman's position. 
An auto vanguard class is made up of two planesmen, the left controlling the four planes and the right controlling the after planes and the rudder. From this position, the planesman controls the depth, speed, course and angle of the submarine in the water. In the event of an emergency to the planes or the rudder, the planesman can also change how power is supplied to the surfaces to maintain control of the submarine. And planesmen do need to work closely with the other members of the front row. They're also responsible for conducting emergency operating procedures, for example, emergency surface in the boat, safely in the event of a flood. Uh, next slide, please, Dodge. So in this picture, you can just about see the steering yoke, which is being highlighted by the small white arrow. Uh, this is used by both, op both operators just in front of the chair. Next slide, please, Dodge. Right, the next position is the ship control officer of the watch. From here, you can issue rev revolution orders to the back aft machinery spaces to control the speed of the boat, as well as controlling the alarms that may come into the control room. He also has the ability to make full main broadcasts throughout the submarine, and this can bring the crew of the boat to the emergency stations through the use of the general alarm. The ship control officer of the watch is responsible for bringing the boat to emergency stations and as such, he needs to have an in-depth knowledge of all systems on board the submarine and the implica implications to the command on the loss or damage to any system on board. Any orders that the planesman receives comes through the ship control off of the watch via the watch lever. Now pass it over to Rob, who will be able to tell you about the panel. Rob. Thanks, Jamie. So what you're looking at here, guys, is what we call the SCC, the Ship Control Console. So at first glance, it may look very complicated with all the bit different buttons and switches, but each panel is broken down into separate systems. For example, the ballast system, which is used when ordered by the captain to either dive for the submarine by flooding water into huge ballast tanks forward and after the submarine. Also, as Jamie mentioned, we use these ballast tanks to surface the submarine in an emergency. We use compressed air from stored bottles to surface the submarine. Another quite important system on this panel is the trim system. The trim system allows us to move water to and from various tanks around the submarine, allowing us to keep what we call a level trim. This basically means we are flat, perfectly straight in the water, so exactly how you are now in your house. Last, lastly, is also, as Jamie mentioned, is we have the alarms panel, which has loads of different alarms on it, but one really important alarm is the atmosphere monitor alarm for the LP electrolyzers. Next slide, please, Dodge. So, so this is the ele LP electrolyzer I look after on board. And basically what it does is creates oxygen. It does this by passing water that we produce on board, which we'll discuss later, through a 10,000 volt DC current. This splits the hydrogen from the oxygen. We get rid of the hydrogen because at 0.4% um, hydrogen becomes explosive. So we get rid of the hydrogen overboard and we keep the oxygen. This equipment is crucial for, in the unlikely event, we do have a fire. So this equipment is crucial for afterwards to, for getting our atmosphere back in spec. And speaking of fires, We'll pass you over to Smudge, who tell you all about fighting fires on board. Mute. You mute. There we go again. Right, cheers, Rob. <laughs> um, so obviously on board we don't have the luxury. I was just phoning the fire department and getting them to deal with it. So everybody on board needs to be a trained firefighter essentially. So on board we've got various different portable firefighting equipment. As you can see there, you've got the extinguishers there. There'll be AFFF extinguishers. So AFFF would be used for what we'd call a carbonaceous fire. So for example, if a pile of paper was on fire, you would use an AFFF extinguisher. You've also got various other extinguishers. You've got CO2 extinguishers, which would be used for an electrical fire. You've also got what we call a dry powder, which if there was an oil burst anywhere, it can create a mist in the atmosphere. And you use that to battle the mist. We've also got a fryer fighter, which is used for the deep fat fryer. And if we go to the next slide, if you see that tank to the right, the S, that's called an SFU. It's class as portable, you wouldn't really move it, but it's essentially just a giant tank of AFFF. So all the stuff that I've just talked about, that's, that would be the first things used at the scene of a fire. 
So that's what we call like the first aid firefighting effort. So after you've turned up with those extinguishers, we've got two people getting dressed into a breathing apparatus with gloves and a hood, and they're called the attack VA. So if you see those red lockers at the back, that's got a breathing apparatus in it with gloves and a hood. So they've got two minutes to get to the scene of the fire and they'll use all the, that previous equipment I've just spoke about. People will basically create a dump of that equipment and they'll be ready for them to pick up. But while all this is happening, you've got another three-man team they are getting dressed. So same again, they're going to be in a breathing apparatus, but this time they're going to have a full suit on. So a full PBI gold suit is what they call it. So if you've ever seen a civilian fire service, that gold clothing they've got on, they'll be wearing the exact same thing. And they've got eight minutes to get to the scene. So they'll be rocking up with what we call center fed hose reels. So you'll see them in front of you there. And as I said, that's a three-man team. So in this team, you'll have a firefighter, a water wall, and a team leader. So I'll go over the roles of all three. So firefighter, as you can tell, his job is to fight the fire. The water wall, what he does is he creates a wall of water between the team and the fire. So if you think of like a garden hose where you have it on mist and it goes to the side, that's what your water wall is doing essentially and creating a seal at like the door. And then you've got the fire uh, the team leader who he's there to take charge of them, keep them right, and he'll be equipped with a thermal imaging camera, so a tick. So he'll be able to check for any hot spots and stuff like that. But usually, by the time any of that has to happen, it's, it's already out. Usually, first person at the scene, which is like an air supply extinguisher, is able to put it out. And that's how we fight fires on board. Now, my primary role on board a submarine is sonar. So sonar is an acronym which stands for, stands for sound, navigation, and ranging. There are two main forms of sonar. They are active and passive. Active is a great piece of equipment, sending a sound wave out into the sea, hitting a solid object like another submarine and giving us information such as bearing and more importantly, range. But there is a massive disadvantage to using active sonar where we can be heard by other ships and submarines and giving away our own position and making us the target. So our preferred method is passive sonar. Every ship, submarine, and believe it or not, aircraft even make, uh, they make a unique sound. And with training, my operators can identify the difference between these target, targets. And then once we identify our target, we can pass this information through to what we call SMACS. SMACS is a submarine command system. And there it is in front of us. When the information about the target has been um, sent to SMAX, the operator will carry out some, um, some equations to help ascertain the range of the target, the direction and speed that it is traveling in. Once this information has been verified, it is then downloaded to a wire-guided torpedo, or I should say a heavyweight wire-guided torpedo. And there we have two of them on the racks. And as you can see, they're called spearfish weighing approximately two tons and traveling at speeds in excess of 60 knots, it's able to hit a target up to 30 miles away with a, with a warhead of 300 kilograms. So as you can imagine, you really don't want to be on the receiving end of this. Ooh. Sorry, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Dodge. So obviously after that, all that hard work that we've just been talking about, it's time to get your head down in your bunk space. So this is one of the bunk spaces on board. So we're all separated into male and female quarters, so there's no sharing of whatsoever. As you can see, nine people sleep, sleep in this um, tight bunk space, and space is at a premium. <laughs> so only take your essential sleeves next slide. Yeah. So for me, those essentials are going to be the uniform that I'm going to wear whilst I'm at sea, uh, pants and socks, obviously, and some gym gear to work out in. And then obviously, because I've been working out and I've been getting nice and hot and sweaty whilst at work as well, I want to have a shower. So I'm going to take a bit of shower gel and a roll of deodorant. Um, 
And then most importantly, for me, is going to be some nutty. Well, we call nutty to you guys is just going to be sweets, chocolate, all that sort of stuff. But nine, but these nine bunks aren't always going to be filled at the same time. So, at, so some people may be awake, some people may be um, sleeping. So they're not always going to be f filled. So for that reason, we work a six hours on, six hours off routine whilst at sea. This means for 12 hours a day, you'll be working. And for the other 12 hours, you can be sleeping. Or you may want to spend some of that off time uh, in the mess. Next slide, please, Dodge. So this is the mess. Uh, or basically, it's pretty much like your front living room. Um, so it's where we go out to chill, chill out, unwind and just relax. So this here is the junior rates mess on board. And this, this room has to complement 70 plus men and women whilst at sea. So in this, in this TV signal, obviously, so we have hooked up to it. We've got a computer hooked up with um, a hard drive. And on that hard drive, it's full of all the latest movies and TV box sets. So you can sit and binge all the latest TV box sets and films whilst at sea. Also, if you're not into that sort of stuff, we've got up to one of the other TVs, we've got a PlayStation or maybe an Xbox hooked, hooked up to those FIFA or even those Call of Duty competitions. The mess is also where we eat. So at mealtimes, it gets turned into basically a diner that these seven, seven girls and boys, and it is served through the silver roller from the gallery. Thank you very much for that, Rob. Now, as Rob just mentioned there, the galley. So first of all, what is a galley? Generally known at home as the kitchen, yeah. But on board a ship or a submarine, it's known as a galley. So the submarine galley is about the same size as an average household kitchen. But the chefs we have on board will turn out four meals a day for a whole ship's company, which is approximately 600 meals a day. What type of meals do we have? I hear you asking. Well, start the day off with a cooked breakfast and then each, well, not every day, but a lot of the days there are set meals that we'll have. So Sunday lunch and then Sunday evening is pizza night. Wednesday, curry night. Friday's always fish and chips. Saturday night is steak night. And just if you are worried, we do cater for vegetarians. So there you can see both ends of our galley. Strax. Thanks, Dodge. So now you can see what we class as the heads. So as you would know it, we call them toilets. In the Navy, they're called heads. And the reason for that was back many, many years ago, on a ship, the wind used to blow from rear to the front, the head of the ship. So where the sailors would have to go to the toilet was at the head. So it's now been called the heads. These heads, sinks, are shared by over 70 people. So if you ever think a normal family, it's hard enough, one or two toilets with three or four people, we tend to share over 70. But the way that we work as submariners, we all respect each other, so we do what we need to do and we get out. We don't tend to dilly-dally. Um, one of the main things that we will try and get as much as possible, the reason I'll say that will come a light later, is a shower. So Rob said he's going to take a shower, he needs a shower gel. But what we need to do then is we have to have special uh, precautions because water, believe it or not, inside the boat is not at the highest levels all the time. So we have a submariner shower. So even though when we're at home, like yourselves, we all enjoy a nice luxury shower for 25 minutes, half an hour, get in, let the water run, a Hollywood as we call it, we have to have a submariner shower, which consists of going in, turn the water on, getting underneath it, even when it's cold, turn it off. You've made yourself wet. You will then, as Rob said, get your shampoo and you will make yourself all bubbly. You will then turn the shower back on, straight under it again. Hopefully it's warmed up a little bit. Rinse all the bubbles off and turn it straight off. This should last about 20 seconds with the water on. So quite a bit different, but we've got to do that. And the reason for that is we have to make our own water. So as you can imagine, we have loads of salt water around us. 
But inside the boat, we don't want to be drinking salt water if you've ever swallowed it at sea. And especially, and more importantly, the reactor definitely does not want to be supplied with salt water for contamination reasons. So what we do is we use distillers. The, the, the distillers we use are called Brabies, and a simple form is it takes the salt water, which we store in massive compensating tanks. We supply that water to the distillers. It boils up, which then creates a vapor. That removes the salt, which then cools the water. And then from that point, depending on where we want to go, so the priority is to supply water to the reactor systems. We then will supply water to forage for, like you said, showers, firefighting, and uh, drinking. So we are not the priority as a reactor. And it all goes into separate tanks. So what then happens is down in the engine room. Next slide, please, Dodge. Down in the engine room, as you can see now, this is class of the lower level, which when you first join up as an ME, marine engineer, you will likely work in. So what happens is just where you can see at that ladder, either side is what you call dog kennels, that's where the bravery would be. The water then comes when it's cooled down into tanks, we send it forward to the fresh water tanks. So that will supply stuff like Rob said, the lysers. We then either send it, if it's really high quality, best we can get, we will send it uh, to a tank aft and we keep it. And it goes to one tank, which is called a made water tank. And if it's out of specification, we will just, as we call, ditch it, get rid of it to the bulges. And that's going to be all the way under all them deck plates you can see there. A lot of this is controlled from Minerva Room. Thank you, Dodge. So, as Rob correctly said, when you first look at all these buttons and uh, everything like that, it can look confusing. But with a lot of training and understanding, it's very similar. They are actually set up into different systems. So, the panel that's highlighted, we call the main control desk. And in Lehman's term, that is where we control the reactor. So, if you've heard about reactors, we've pulled the rods. We've also got another throttle. So as Jamie said, when revolution orders get sent back aft, that's where we can react on the revolution orders as well for a remote, as well as in the engine room. And we've also got where you can slightly see all the different colors on the panel to your right. That is an electrical mimic. So we can use that to control all our electricity and all the systems. Some of the other systems we control is firefighting, alarms, the same as Jimmy, and we can actually raise a general alarm. So if we do have a fire like Smudge told us about, we can raise the alarm and wake everybody up. It's been in the rack. Thank you, Dodge. Thank you very much for that, Strax. Now, that comes towards the end of our, uh, our briefing, yeah, about submarines. So just to summarise there, we've actually talked about the physical size of a submarine. As I said, 150 metres long and 16 and a half thousand tonnes. Yeah, Jamie went through the steering positions. Okay, bearing in mind that we've got two steering positions, one for the four planes, one for the after planes, and it's very much like flying an aeroplane. Same principle. And then uh, Rob went into what we have on the ship's con um, ship control console, which is forward of our submarine, and that's going to really look after a lot of our high-pressure systems, our hydraulics our air, and more importantly, where we can surface our submarines. And then the more, the, one of the most important things for everyone on board is that LP electrolyzer you can see on the screen there now, yeah, which is gonna allow us to breathe, which allows us the longevity of staying at sea. And then we, we touched on a little bit about the sensors and the weapons, primarily sonar, yeah, and as you, you might remember, which stands for, stands for sound, navigation, and ranging. Yeah, and then it comes back to fresh water. Again, allowing us that longevity of staying at sea, that we can make our own fresh water. And then where all of these things realistically are controlled, for, um, controlled from, which is a manoeuvring room. So that now concludes our briefing on life on board a submarine and realistically how it works. So I'll, what I'm gonna do is stop sharing that PowerPoint now and bring myself and my team back in. So thank you very much for that. And I think we might get some questions. So cadets, if you can all put your questions in the Q and A box down the bottom um, and we'll be able to see them and we'll be able to answer them. Um, 
while we're waiting for them to come in, I've got one for the panel. If I want to be a submariner, how would I go about doing it? Well, first and foremost, you, you could realistically take the first step now by speaking to myself and my team. Because as I think we had alluded to earlier, we are an SMRT, which is a submarine recruitment team. But you will get most of your information from off the Royal Navy websites, which are um, behind some of us, yeah, and your local area or your AVCO, which is your Armed Forces Careers Office. And there, your know, um, careers advisors, and they'll be able to tell you about all of the jobs um, within the Royal Navy. But again, from our point of view, more specifically within the submarine service. Um, one that's come into the chat box, where would you go in the event of a fire? Well, I'll quickly take that one, actually. It's everyone, yeah, and we're all taught this from when we're little. Yeah, if you see danger, you run away from it. In the Royal Navy, um, um, you're actually, you're reprogrammed because we see a fire, we run to the fire. Because if that fire isn't out as quickly as, as, you know, as it can be, it will spread. And as you can imagine, the worst place to be is in a steel tube under the sea that's on fire. Jamie? Jamie? Yeah, I mentioned earlier on that um, one of my roles is to actually drive the submarine. Um, I probably do, say, one or two hours when I'm on watch driving the boat. The rest of the time when I'm not actually driving it or sitting in the office doing any work, I'm actually one of the attack BA. So like what was mentioned earlier on, in the event of a fire or, you know, a hydraulic oil um, burst on board the submarine, I'm one of those teams that has to be within the scene of the accident, within the scene, within two minutes. And like Dodge mentioned, you know, you can see the size of the boat to get, you know, anywhere can be a struggle. So as soon as that general alarm goes off, I'm getting the uh, breathing apparatus on. I'm grabbing the nearest extinguisher for the fire and I'm rushing to that scene, hoping to get relieved within eight minutes from the three-man team, which will be getting dressed in one of the other areas of the boat. So we have two teams. One will be getting dressed back aft. One will be getting dressed forward. So we, we can throw a lot of bodies at these fires and uh, constantly relieve them. So, you know, when a uh, bit of equipment may run out, were able to provide more equipment to them straight away. Dodge? I was going to say, hang on that. So, as Smodge said, the three-man team, we tend to take that as a priority team as engineers. So one thing, probably the best way to answer your question as well is, like Dodge said, if you're near it, you're going to go to it. But if you're not near it, what we have is actually a watching station bill. So a station is when we call 100% manning. So like I said about manoeuvring room, you'll hear a general alarm, which is three big loud claxons. So, for example... As engineers back aft, what happened, we might be in bed and we'll get woken up by that. We've got eight minutes, like you said, to get out of bed, get dressed and get to your emergency station, which Jamie clearly said will be back aft. So obviously that doesn't seem a lot of time, but we've all done it and we can all do it faster. So we'll be getting dressed. So while Jamie or Dodge said somebody's at the start of the scene, is say, for example, Dodge have found the fire, he will be dealing with that. He'll be then waiting on Jamie to back him up. But what happens is we all know our jobs, so we all have a job and a place to be according to this watching station bill when it comes to emergency stations. So that's how we know that, like Dodge said, if we're near it, we get straight to the fire and we help out. Well, um, so next question, I think it's one for everyone. Um, I think you might have mentioned it at the beginning, but what rank is everyone of you? Someone's asking. Well, I'm a chief, um, and then I'll just do everyone else. So I've got Strax, Jamie, and Rob. They're all leading hands. Rob and uh, Strax, they're both engineers. As Jamie had said, he's uh, he's a writer, so he deals with our pay. And Smudge, he's an engineer, and he's uh, um, able right. So we do, you know, we, we do um, cover all eventualities between us, just about. Uh, next one then. What is it like to be on a submarine mentally? So that's quite a good question. Uh, and who wants to go for this one then? So do you want to give this a shot? Uh, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So mentally it can be quite taxing. There's no, I'm not going to lie about it. Sometimes 
you can be away for quite a while. You can be away for up to like 20 weeks, essentially. But once you get, once you're a couple of weeks in it, you just get into a routine. You go to the gym, you're watching films. So it's not actually too bad. And when you get back, you get plenty of time off, plenty of time with your family. And you've got plenty of money. So, yeah, it's pretty good. Yes, as, as much said, it is, it is difficult. There's no two ways about it. And, you know, everyone's got someone um, that they want to see back at home. And one of the downsides is that when you're away, especially on a Vanguard class submarine, you get communications, but only to you. So family can send a message to you. You cannot reply to it. If you're on an SSN, which... Um, uh, well, myself, Jamie, Rob, and Strax are, then we can have a bit of a two-way. But if there is something going back on in the UK that we're not to know about, they will stop our communications. And I normally give an example of that, which was the 7-7 bombings in London. Um, and we, we, we knew nothing about that for about a week or so, purely because of the fact is they didn't want to risk so someone on board having someone involved in it you know someone hurt in, in the bombing so sometimes we are we we have information kept from us but if you think about it it's for the right reason mm -hmm. um what age do you have to be during submariners from the well from the you can apply from the age of uh, 15 years and nine months um but realistically, it's it's from the age of 18 because you're not allowed to transit uh, um, a nuclear reactor until, over the, until you're over the age of 18. But you still can go to sea below the age of 18. Um, what qualifications can the Navy give you? I suppose that's with submariners as well. Ah, no, Jamie. OK, um, it depends, really. I mean, there is like quite a few jobs within the Navy that do require uh, specialist degrees. And, um, you know, if you want to be, if you want to go on to achieve like the rank of, you know, or the role of a marine engineer and officer, then you would be expected to have um, degrees in, you know, you know, some sort of uh, science type thing. If you want to join up like I did, mm -hmm. I said, then you can have no, no, qualif no formal qualifications at all. But what the Navy is good at is to um, encourage self-improvement within the Navy. So, you know, I've gone on and achieved like my health and safety qualifications. I've got BTECs and um, I've also got like an MVQ level three in business and administration. So even though I left school and then worked in factories and didn't have any, any qualifications when I went into the careers office, through my own, well, through, through like the Navy basically just helping me, I've been able to go on and achieve these qualifications. There are people that I know that have joined up with their uh, degrees as well, that, you know, even though I did say, you know, you do need a specialist degree to become an officer, there's plenty of people that have joined up with degrees and become a rating, you know, so there's nothing stopping you achieving what you want to achieve if you've left school and you're not happy at all with your qualifications. It really is role dependent. Dodge? Yeah, I was going to say, ge ge but generally speaking for ratings, you do not need any formal qualifications for any ratings um, job in the Navy. But again, a careers, um, a careers advisor will be able to give you more information on, uh, um, on that and on the Navy website. But generally speaking, ratings, you need no, no formal qualifications. You just have to pass your um, recruitment test. So following on from that then, how long is the training for being a Samaritan? Right, there's actually what I'll do is I'll, I'll pass this one over to my sidekick Strax because myself and Strax, our previous job was teaching the submarine qualification course. So, uh, Strax, yeah, cheers, dog. Maybe you can help me out with the slightly different branches as well. So, let's just be honest everybody's going to go to our phase one training at Rally, HMS Rally. We'll just say for now there is some other places it's getting done, and that's going to take 10 weeks, and that's where. No matter what branch you are, if you join the surface fleet, you will go and do your basic training. And that is the best way described to turn you from a civilian into a sailor. Sail, sailor sorry. Once you've done that, you will then go and do what we call phase two training. So, for example, myself, Rob, Smudge, we went to um, Sultan, HMS Sultan, 
Gosport and we went to engineering school basically, whereas Jamie, his phase two training was to learn how to be a writer and Dodgy's was to learn how to be a sonar expert. So that's all depending on slightly different time. Dodge, can you remember roughly how long? Yeah, I mean, give, give or take, I mean, for um, non-technical ratings, you're, you're, you're generally looking at between about the eight to 16 week mark, there or thereabout. And then for the technical ratings, you could be about six months. But once that, that training has been done, you'll then reconvene and then um, do the um, start doing your specific submarine training. So, Sandy? Yeah, so as Dodge correctly said, we come and you join what we call SMQ, which stands for Submarine Qualification Course. At the moment, you can do it down south in Devonport, but the majority of the courses will be for A boats and uh, V boats, which is the Astute class and the Vanguard class, will be up in Faz Lane, which is in the west coast of Scotland. You'll start on day one, and that will last 10 weeks. And every Samana rating will do this course mixed, if you're a chef, an engineer, it doesn't matter. And what that's going to give us is it's going to give us that basic knowledge about submarines for every part of the boat, because we all need to know. So Jamie being a writer, Dodge being sonar, and us being engineers, we need to know about weapons. We need to know about certain valves work and how the routines work that we might not work with every day but the main thing we have to know as well is firefighting that's what's mostly drilled into you in this course so long story short you'll learn certain systems like high pressure air hydraulics firefighting routines all the stations we talked about as well where to be how to find out where you're meant to be and that's going to give you that seven week lessons and progress test to find out how you get on and then you're going to finish that off a walkthrough to which is walking around um, on our 3D walkthrough or on the boat when you get there and sitting in front of a couple of experienced senior rates and possibly officers and doing a board which is basically being grilled and showing your knowledge. Once you've done that you'll join the boat and we tend to say the average for that because it's quite hard with it is about a year so we found probably about a year to a year and a bit uh, if Dodger agrees with that, with the students that have been coming through in the last couple of years. So that's like Dodger. Yeah. Said, if you're joining up at 16 and a half anyway, he said, don't get on the boat till 18. By the time you finish all your training, you're going to be about 18. We, we have a couple, maybe out of 100, we have two or three that are just finishing at under 18, but not many. Um, so I would say about over a year, um, you should be able to finish all your training and get on the boat. But then I say finish, I think of this, guys agree, your training just starts again. The truthful answer is your training never stops in the Royal Navy. Hopefully that's quite a long-winded answer, but hopefully that helps the person's <laughs> question answers. Yeah, that was good. Um, so I think following on my seat from that then, uh, what's the pay like and is there anything extra for doing oh. this? Well, I'm and, and you're our expert now. <laughs> Sorry, Jamie. <laughs> Okay, um, the pay when you join up is about 16,000 a year, okay? And then once you're actually on the train strength, then your pay goes up to just over 20,000 a year. Depending on how fast, though, that you want to get promoted, what I will just do is I will just talk about, like, what an AB, you know, can potentially earn. So your pay rises annually in increments. So when you get to the top level as an AB, you're probably earning about 32,000 a year. So anything from 20, 29,000 up to 32,000, depending on what job that you're actually doing. For the submarine pay, it's paid uh, on different levels. So every five years, while you're on a submarine or in a submarine billet, you will then get, uh, you'll then move up another level of submarine pay. So the basic level of submarine pay is 13 pounds 75p. For a 31 day month, that works out at £426.25. But well, like I say, if that, ri that rises every five years, and the highest level that it can go up to is just over £24 a day. So you can see how, as you progress through your career, the longer you stay in the submarines, the more money you will earn. There's also something called submarine supplements, which you will earn whenever you're actually attached to the submarine, two different rates. There's the shore rate and it's the actual sea rate that you will earn when you actually do go to sea. Now, to put it into perspective, 
if somebody joined the Navy the same day as me and they went to general service, so he's now working on an aircraft carrier, he's doing the same job as me, he's holding the same rank, I'm earning about £950 a month more than him. That's just due to my submarine pay and my submarine supplements and a few other things that are thrown in as well. Now, the analogy I always use it whenever I'm doing my submarine recruitment and going to schools and job fairs, this sort of thing, I always say, imagine going into McDonald's for a job with your best mate, and then three months down the line, you find out your best mate is earning a thousand pounds a month more, more extra than you. You wouldn't be happy, would you? And that's what being a submariner is compared to being in general service, the money. So I hope that's answered the question for you, mate. Um, so sort of following on from that one then, um, what's it like re-acclimatising re to life after being at sea? So I suppose once you've resurfaced them. Bob, well, you've been a bit quiet there. Do you fancy uh, taking that one? Coming back alongside, my friend. Yeah, no worries. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a difficult one, actually. So it sort of depends what role you've been doing, so on what we've been doing. So if we've been transiting, uh, so if we've been doing a bit of surface running, there might have been a, a bit of time to get up and go, go in the fin. That's a bit at the top of the submarine. Might be a chance to go in there. And uh, the, the smokers among us go up there and have a quick cigarette or whatever, and then you sort of acclimatise, and then before you're already getting home. But for likes of me, who I'm a I'm a hardcore worker and I just stay in the engine room constantly, um, it can be a bit difficult. You come up and you've gone from artificial lights to obviously natural light. It can be a bit strange and a bit of a strain on on your eyes. They said not to drive for like 48 hours when you. come back um i'd probably say that's not because everyone just wants to get home um but uh yeah it's it's not too bad it's as soon as you're it's a bit strange because as soon as you're away from your family you miss them but then as soon as you're away from the lads on the boat you miss them and then you just want to go back and go out with them is it's it's quite strange but yeah it's 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 nice to be home but then it's also nice to know that your your mates are still there with you as well that it's certainly, it's certainly, a it's certainly a unique working experience. It's like where Rob yeah. said about, you know, it's driving when you get back. Um, it was always uh, advised not to drive for 24, 48 hours before because where well, you'd never seen any anything further than about 50 feet in front of you. That's as far as, you know, and then suddenly you're getting back and you've got a, a horizon you haven't seen an horizon sometimes for months. So, yeah, it is certainly a, a unique and different work experience than anything else I, that I can imagine. Sorry, you're, you're muted. That was my turn this time. Um, there's so many questions I'm just looking through. Um, as a submariner, do you also get to go on ships, or is it just submarines? No, if you um, if you join the navy as a submariner, you um, you will only be a submariner. You can request to return back to general service, which that's people on the ships. Very few people ever do, but the majority of the those type of things always comes to what they what we call is the needs of the service, and the needs of the service are if they require. For argument's sake, ten people of my uh, rank or my rate um, and my specialisation, there'll have to be ten people there in the Royal Navy submarine service doing that. If I say, "Well, I would like to leave it," the chances are very few and far between because there'll be then it will drop them down to nine people. So now nah, you join the Navy as a submariner, you generally mm -hmm. stay as a submariner. Brilliant. Um, do you all still serve on submarines or are you all shoreside now? This job is just a shoreside job for us, realistically. So we could all be expected to, be, um, to go back to sea. This is our, our, uh, our downtime as such, away from being on frontline submarines. Okay. Um, 
more than naval battlefield one. A astute class submarines, a couple of any missiles. Yes. T land, Tomahawk land attack missiles. Easy one. Um, when you come back, how long do you get at home? Right, you can put that to any one of the team there, guys. I mean, because there's not a there's not a hard and fast answer to that. It's again, it all goes smudged. Do you want to take that? You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll take it because the V boat running's a bit different. So on on V boats, you tend to you maybe go away once a year, and you'll be kind of hard grafting for about half a year as well. But then after that, you can be upwards of kind of a year to like fifteen months where you're getting a lot of time at home, you're getting every weekend off, you're getting weeks off at a time. So I can't speak for fleet boats, I'm not, I'm not sure how the time, time off works on A boats or anything like that, but on V boats, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of time off after it. I survived that one. Um, for joining, is there any height restrictions, minimum, maximum? Or is there someone really tall on the questions here? Um... No, uh, we, we, uh, when I was teaching, we once had uh, a very short girl. I don't think she was quite five foot. Was she Strax? Um, oh, we got her in the bomb shop. Yeah, we had to we had to take her down down a submarine just to make sure that she. And uh, we have a an emergency what we call EBS, uh, which is emergency breathing system, and it looks like a gas mask, but it's got a hose coming off off it, which has to be plugged in to a coupling to supply you with clean, dry air. Um, clean, dry, breathable air. Yeah, if in the event of the atmosphere going out, out of spec on board, so like if we have a fire or something like that, well, we had to make we had to ensure that she was tall enough to be able to plug that in in one of one of the most obscure places. And it was one of these things where they're saying, right, climb up here by hook by crook, you have to do it. And she did it, and she's now having a very successful. Um, career, I think she's now been promoted to lead in hand, but um, for that, I would again, it's one of those ones. Um, ask a careers advisor, um, at your local armed forces careers office. If, if it's for being tall, though, just be that I'm six foot three, and um, I've had no problems. And I actually taught somebody that was, I'm gonna say, six seven and. They're on something. So I think for tall, yes, you'll hear about all oh, your bang your head. To be honest, it's um every bangs their head, but tall people tend to know to watch out a bit more. So it's usually the people that are about perfect height just to skim it. And usually people with bald heads are the ones that usually bang their head more than anybody. So yeah, don't worry if you're tall and like I said, if you're too short, um best bet is to ask. If you don't ask, you'll never know. Well, um this book that's coming up from the Astute Class 1 here. So how are T-Lambs fired? <laughs> Sorry? How are the T-Lambs fired on the Astute? Out, out of a torpedo tube. Uh, that's, you know, it's, it, it's, there's not a, um, there's not a um, specific um, uh, launcher for it. They just get loaded into a torpedo tube, the same as a torpedo, and then they'll come out of a torpedo tube, broach out of the, out of the sea, and then, um, a booster rocket will then ignite and then it will go off onto its jolly way and uh, land wherever it's um, designated to. If, if you're really interested, uh, just YouTube them. They're on YouTube. <laughs> um, I think it's a bit of the last one before we wrap up then. So uh, quite nicely as well. So how long can you stay as a submariner for in the Royal Navy? <laughs> well, I've been doing it for 33 years so far and I'm still going strong. So, um, and there's people who have been in longer than me. So realistically, um, you, you can carry on pushing submarines around until you're in, well into your mid fifties. So, and I, I'm just, I'm just about to turn 50. So I think that's where we'll wrap it up there. Um, plenty of questions. Thank you to all the cadets. Um, thank you to the panelists as well. Thanks for turning up. Thanks for being here. Um, and yeah, anything from you guys before we all close out? No, um, I'd like just on behalf of myself and my team, I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, inviting us to, to come to your evening this evening. And uh, we enjoyed doing this. And as we said the last time, and we will say again, Whenever you want us, we're always here and uh, 
if you want us to do do something a little bit different, I'm sure we can put something together. And uh, but, or sorry, that was another little bit of information that uh, Strax did come out about about 3D walkthroughs that we have. All those pictures that we showed you are from the genuine um, submarine uh, for the 3D walkthrough that we train our submariners on. They've just been um, uh, was it screen, um, screen captured. So that is the the what you would use for our training. But no, thank you all very much. Much appreciated for inviting us.